we like to do things in the world that are intuitive. We like to drive cars where we can fit into the seats. Um, that's why we all drive vehicles rather than go-karts. And, uh, you know, it's always fun to see the Shriners driving around in the little cars, but they're not that practical in winter or on the freeway. So we like to wear clothes that fit us. We like to have homes that fit us, and all of these things are intuitive. But when it comes to following Jesus, it's sometimes going to feel like you're driving around in a little Shriner car, and you're trying to obey what he says, and it just doesn't feel quite right. You know why? That's because it doesn't feel right in the flesh, but it feels right in the spirit. And Brother Kyle is talking to us about about trusting in the Lord for our own mental, emotional, and physical and spiritual health and well-being. <laughs> and it is a great health plan. Amen. Praise the Lord. He's better than any insurance, and He is more capable than any physician. Praise the Lord. So when you come up against a situation where the world, whatever it is that you're getting, your, wherever it is you're getting your advice from, says something to you that doesn't quite fit. If it fits, then there you go. You're living your daily life. But the world says something to you that doesn't quite fit. Remember that you belong to another insurance plan. And it doesn't have a PPO or an HMO. It doesn't have any kind of a worldly network. But there are ministering spirits. Amen. And then there are spirits of healing. And then there are the gifts of the Spirit, which work in us to help us to speak and to claim our healing and our deliverance. When all of the other things we've tried are not working, we cry out to Jesus and trust in Him. So thank you for that, Brother Kyle. I receive it. And uh, I'm challenged by it. Praise God. I want us to turn our Bibles to John 6, 11 through 12. John chapter 6, verses 11 through 12. And we're going to... Go into the word of the Lord today. Thank you, Brother Brandon, for opening your home yesterday to the men's fellowship. That was that was a lot of a lot of fun. I don't think this is there's anything coming out of it. We uh, had a great time of fellowship. Brother Brandon made us. Uh, breakfast that uh, will be hard to surpass. So he set the bar really high um, for whoever has it next by feeding us steaks. And Brother Andrew said, well, at least you didn't give bacon because then I can have bacon at the next one. So they were really good steaks and I love some steak and eggs. And so we're going to try to keep having these every two to three months. And um, so very excited about that. But the, the main blessing was that there was a tremendous openness around the dinner table at Brother Brandon and Sister Alexis's home. And we were able to open up and share the Word of God in, in a very honest way with each other. And so I went away encouraged and I feel like I'm not stretching it when I say that all of the men that came went away encouraged and so that's really good. Praise God. John 6, 11 through 12, and Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled he said unto his disciples gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. I want you to know today that Jesus saves the scraps. Praise God. Thank you for your word, Lord. I love it and I receive it. I've already received it as I studied it, Lord Jesus. I wanted to change my life, but I'm, my prayer is that the other people that are here in the sound of my voice will also want it to change their life and that they will also receive the word of God as it is good bread, Lord Jesus, to be received. And we have come today to receive of your word as we've already had a touch from your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Continue that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Amen. There are those people in this world that don't like leftovers. And I understand that. Uh, I know that most of the people that I know that don't like leftovers, I, I don't judge them. But most of them grew up in a poor home like I did. And they grew up eating leftovers because mama or daddy, as it were, was trying to stretch the budget and the groceries. And that's OK. And if you don't like leftovers, that's OK. I got family members that don't want to touch it once it's past the first meal. But I personally like to make new things out of those leftovers, whatever. And so the church is open for both groups of people. It's OK. 
There's no judgment if you don't like leftovers, and there's no judgment if you do like to make new things out of leftovers. Um, but Jesus did like leftovers. And Jesus made it a point to teach with everything he did. Everywhere he walked, every glance, every prayer, and every statement that he made, even if it was seemingly in jest, was filled with spiritual productivity. Because he was, as people called him in his day, a rabbi. And he was the rabbi of rabbis, which is to say a teacher of teachers. And everything that he did was filled with purpose and filled with lessons for us to learn. And that is what the Word of God is still today. It's powerful and it's alive and there, is a, there are scriptures that you will read for 20 years and they will mean something to you and then all of a sudden, boom, they will mean something new to you because that is the power of the Word of God. It's a living, breathing creation and everything that Jesus did was the same way because He was God manifest in flesh. The scripture tells us He was the Word of God manifest in flesh. And so the Bible tells us that He looked looked over at his disciples and he made sure to focus on the things that had fallen to the ground or were up on cloths, pieces of fish and pieces of fragments that of bread that had were left over after Jesus had supernaturally multiplied by and remember the Bible says the only thing Jesus did to those five loaves and two fishes. What did he do to them? He gave thanks. So another scripture says he blessed them, which means he prayed a prayer of blessing. Be, because in Jesus' day, it was common to pray after the meal. But in Jesus, when Jesus came on the scene, he flipped that and began to pray over the food before he break it. And so Jesus started a new tradition. And so one of the reasons why I, I did a lesson on this a few years ago at our joint Thanksgiving service, one of the reasons why we pray over our food is because that's what Jesus Jesus did. And we're praying for the Lord to bless it. And uh, if, if we want to throw in a little bit of a bless this day, then fine. And if you want to bless the hands that prepared it, <laughs> then I'll take that blessing or whoever prepared it will take that blessing. But Jesus was blessing this food and he was blessing the mama that made it and the little boy that gave it and the food. And when he prayed over it, it began, something began to happen in that. And somehow as they reached into each perspective hand or basket as it were to hand it out there was always something more and so these people were fed in, in two different occasions once with 4,000 men besides women and children another time with 5,000 men besides women and children anywhere each time from 10 to 20,000 people on the side of a hill on the side of a sea they were fed by the supernatural power of God now I've actually seen that happen in my life I remember there were a couple of times so when we were pastoring in Buffalo, Missouri, where uh, sister, we, we didn't have, we thought we didn't have enough and it was pretty bad, the showing for the potluck <laughs> and there wasn't that much. And I remember one time we had a lady uh, for about a year and a half in our church from East Texas. Her name was Sister Barbara. She said, we're going to pray over the food that the Lord would multiply the food. And there was quite a few people that showed up that day. And, uh, you know, the pastor and the pastor's wife were wondering how we're going to feed everybody because this is a pit of what has been given for who needs to be fed. And I want you to know there were leftovers. I know there were leftovers because we had a lady in the church that liked to dig through the trash and grab the leftovers. Now, my belief and doctrine of eating leftovers does not include digging through the trash. I just want you to know that if I had uh, cattle, if I had chickens, then I might dig through the trash and, and give it to them, maybe to the dogs. But that's how I remember that there were leftovers that day because that sister came and actually got a couple of, God help her, you know, we were trying to teach, you know, that is definitely not the way to live by digging through the trash. And I remember that day, God blessed us so much that there's all this left over. And after that, I never once worried again about that situation because God was able to provide. And this is not exactly what my lesson is about today, but I've come today to tell you that God will provide more than enough. This doesn't mean you shouldn't do your part and it doesn't mean you shouldn't plan for your own family or be lazy about it. But if you happen to come into a day where Jesus has got you on the 
the side of a sea and there was no grocery store in the village. And even if you went to the village, the stores would be closed and 200 penny worth of bread would not be enough to feed these thousands of people. If you happen to get in that situation because God sees it to, to cause it to turn about that way, then God will provide for you. There's a lot of, there's a lot of factors involved in that. But if, if you get in a situation of, uh, of no making of your own and, and God is wanting you to be stretched and pushed a little further, I want you to know he'll provide in that situation if you've done your best and they had all done their best and Jesus meant for it all to happen. Jesus wasn't accidentally preaching so long and he forgot to feed everybody. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Jesus saves the scraps. The Bible tells us uh, that every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. And it tells us that every single one of us has sinned. And it tells us that each of our righteousnesses in Isaiah is like filthy rags, which is an unclean thing, not worthy to even be touched uh, because it is so unclean. That is what we are. I want you to know today that every, each and every single one of us was leftovers. I want you to know today that before I build you up, I want to tear you down. Before I build you up and encourage you that Jesus Christ loves you, I'm going to tell you, you and I are absolutely worthless without Jesus Christ. We are just leftovers that are laying on the side of a hillside with little bits of saliva hanging to them. That's what Jesus told his disciples to go and get. There is nothing appetizing about someone else's saliva <laughs> unless you happen to be starving then you just don't care. That's what we are. We're the lowest of the low, the dust, because we were created from the dirt and we used to play around on the playground and we'd get a little dirt and we would say, God made dirt, dirt don't hurt. <laughs> Which I don't know, you know, if it's necessarily theologically correct, but I know that, that uh, one of the ways that you actually can heal a wound is by doing the old, old adage of rubbing some dirt in it. You can actually do that until you get a little bit uh, to where you can cleanse that wound and we used to rub a little dirt in it and go on about our play. But I want you to know something. That's what we are. We are just the lowest of the low. Without Jesus Christ, we are unrighteous. We are absolutely altogether, the Bible says, become filthy. We do not have anything that we have ever done that is good enough to come into the presence of a holy God. We are filled with sin from the moment that we are conceived, not the moment we are born, but the moment we are conceived, because we know the Bible teaches that life begins at conception, not at attachment, but at conception. When those two cells come together, there is sin in that being because of the sin of Adam and Eve that was passed on to us, uh, and that the the weight of the first Adam is upon us from the time we are conceived. I want you to know that there is no reason for us to be built up with pride within ourselves. The number one greatest sin of the flesh is pride, but there's no reason for us to have it, which makes it quite an enigma, doesn't it? It's quite, a, quite an oxymoron that we would believe that we have the right to be arrogant. But I want you to know something. My flesh will always do that. My flesh will always try to creep up and say, well, fingers Fingers squarely placed in lapels. Look at me. I'll just sit here and polish my nails on my lapel. And I'll just, I feel so good about myself today. I want you to know something today. I've not come to discourage you. I've come to set you right in Jesus Christ. The first place we need to understand is that we are nothing but the lowest of the low. We are the scraps, the leftovers. Jesus cares enough to love everybody, no matter how discarded they are, no matter how unappetizing they may may look. He didn't save us because of our own righteousness. And Paul said, not of works that I have done, but it was his love. He did not have to walk among us and not be ashamed to call us brethren, the Bible says. He had every reason to be ashamed to call us brethren because he didn't know any sin. He had every reason to feel ashamed to walk among us. He had every reason to not want to be brought forth as a man made of a woman made under the law. And yet he was not ashamed to do that. He was not ashamed to walk among us. He was not ashamed to love us. And if he had done all of these things, if that wasn't enough, he had no reason to want to give his life for us. To willingly go through a false trial with false witnesses in the middle of the night, illegal in every way, 
and to be crucified between two thieves. He had no reason to want to do that. And yet he did it. He did it for scraps, Brother James. He did it for leftovers. The things that people don't want to even touch that are worthy only of the trash and for the birds. I want you to know Jesus saves the scraps. He loves us. Praise the Lord. Even though I had nothing to bring to the table but my own belief in him that he was able to reach down and to love me. I'm so thankful thankful that Jesus loves the scraps. He saves the scraps. Jesus loves the leftovers. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. The Bible says there was a man who created a situation wherein he was scraps and leftovers. He took his father's inheritance and said, I want it early before you die, which was an insult to his father. And he excommunicated himself from his father's home and he went into another land the Bible says and he spent it all on riotous living we call this man the prodigal son it's a parable that Jesus told of a fictional story that Jesus told to display a spiritual truth and so Jesus said he went and he spent everything and when he spent everything there was a great famine a mighty famine in the land and so the crops weren't coming in and the cattle were dying and only the richest of the rich had anything left. He went, found somebody that had swine, and he began to take care of the swine. The Bible says he wasn't even fed well enough or paid enough when he took care of the swine to stave off his great hunger. The Bible says he would fain have filled his belly with the scraps that the swine were eating. And he was not in his right mind. He was not in the right mind of being a son. So the Bible says it was in that moment when he had gotten down to where he was barely even able to live off of the peelings and the scraps that were fed to the hogs. Then he came to his right mind and began to realize I would be able to be a servant in my father's house and I would be better fed than this. Then I'm going to arise. I'm going to go to my father. The Bible says he did and he arose and went to his father and he said, Dad, I've sinned in your sight. I know that I offended you by taking my inheritance early. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. You know, the Bible tells us what he was getting ready to say. He was getting ready to say what he had developed in his mind that he was going to say to his dad. The Bible says that the prodigal son in his mind while he was wallowing in the mud with the swine said to himself, I'm going to tell my dad, let me just be a hired servant. Will you just hire me? But he never got that out, Brother James, because the Bible says the father interrupted him. <laughs> and he said, I want you to go. He, he didn't even listen to any of that. He, he hollered at the servants because he had run to his son. He said, you go get the robe and that calf that we've been waiting for for Christmas Day. Not literally, but for the feast day, I want you to kill it. We're going to have a big party. He was dead. He's now alive. He was lost. He's now found. This is the view of our Heavenly Father towards us when we were scraps. The Bible says, scarcely would a righteous man die for someone who is righteous. But God commended his love towards sinners in that while we were yet sinners. Hallelujah. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I'm so thankful that Jesus loves the scraps. I'm so thankful that when I came to him, weary, worn, and sad, uh, he didn't even listen to any of my, and all he wanted was my heart of repentance. Everything else, he just, I don't even care about that. I forgive you. I wash your sins uh, in the blood uh, uh, that I I freely gave on Calvary. I'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. Jesus saves the scraps. He doesn't just love the scraps. He saves the scraps. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus accepts the discarded. Let's look at Luke 23 and 39 through 43. We were discarded. I want you to know that Jesus loves unlikely candidates. David. The greatest king in the history of Israel, whose heart and mind were after God's own heart, and in whose image the Messiah was to come and reign. And the Old Testament prophets didn't know the name of the only begotten Son of God, so they just called him David or Messiah. 
This was somebody that God took out of the sheep coat, the Lord told him. We know the Lord chooses unlikely candidates. Jesus accepts the discarded. Jesus was crucified between two discarded people. Luke 23, 39 through 43, and one of the malefactors, which means we, we learned that the Department of Corrections in Minnesota doesn't like the word inmate, so they use offenders, which I think is good because it constantly reminds the people that these people, and this is what we were told over the course of the 11 years that I went into prison, and some of you as much as 14 years into the prison in Rust City, call them offenders and don't trust one of them. We were told that every time we went into orientation, do not trust them with your personal information. Do not trust them as much as you would someone who is outside. So the Bible calls these men malefactors, which means they were offenders. They, they had done bad things. And this is where our Lord and Savior was crucified in between two people. He had done nothing wrong and he was crucified between two offenders. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. So there's just the rage, the animalistic rage of somebody who is dying. But the other is in his right mind answering, rebuked the other malefactor, the other thief, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? In other words, he called him a hypocrite. And we indeed justly, meaning we're here being crucified because we did wrong. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So this man was dying. They broke his leg. They didn't break Jesus' legs. But they broke their legs so they, they would die and not be able to breathe through the asphyxiation process of crucifixion, which was the main way that crucifixion killed people, was because it cut off the diaphragm's ability to squeeze and inhale oxygen out of the air and to exhale carbon dioxide. So when you die in crucifixion, unless you've been stabbed in the stomach or beaten like Jesus had, you die of asphyxiation because you can't breathe. And so you can prop your toes up on the nails that you're on there or on the, the rope that you're crucified by to catch a breath. And so they would break one of their legs so they couldn't prop their toes up to make the death all the more painful. And this is what was happening to them. And this man is conserving his breath. And he's like, I'm done with you, other thief. I want to turn and talk to this man. And he says to him, I believe that you're going into your kingdom. He didn't say that in so many words, but he said it by saying, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So Old Testament, remember the New Testament had not yet come because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So this was still under the old covenant. Jesus had the power to forgive sins. This was not the first time he forgave sins. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt, shalt thou be with me in paradise, which is the place of rest. You're going with me into the place of rest. I want you to know that I am receiving your faith in me and that I am going to take you with me. Jesus accepted the discarded one. Rather than, as he had every right to do, say, it is so wrong that I, who am in fact the king of Israel and the king of the whole world, am being crucified between these two. I'm not going to talk to either one of them. He had every right to do that. But with love, he accepted the confession of faith of the one thief who in his confession made himself available for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus did it and said, you're going to be with me today. It's going to be all right. Jesus accepts the discarded, no matter how ugly it is. I'm going to tell you something else. Jesus sees more than we can see. Because the Bible says that the Pharisees and some people from the temple brought a woman who was caught in the act of adultery to Jesus and basically threw her down at Jesus' feet. And said, the, the law says for us to stone her. They didn't say all of the law because the law says for us to stone her and him. Okay, so they only brought her. So they were in clear violation of the law and were most likely covering up for somebody that maybe they knew, maybe not. I don't know about that, but they definitely were not bringing the guy. And so Jesus, it, Jesus was smart, right? 
Right. Jesus was smart. People said things like, never a man spake like this man. And people said things like, the Bible says things like about them after this, they didn't ask him any more questions. So Jesus was able to shut people up. And so since Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, he knew the Proverbs. And you know what's in the Proverbs? It says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. I'm paraphrasing, or you're going to end up in folly as well. So Jesus didn't answer the fools according to their folly. They already knew that they should have brought the man and the woman to be stoned. But Jesus answered them far above what they were saying by saying, let him that is without among you, that is without sin, cast, first cast a stone at her. Jesus, knowing all things, he sideswiped their taunting and sideswiped their accusatory, accusatory language. The whole reason they brought her before him was to get him caught in some kind of uh, word argument, word war of words, if you will. You see, when Jesus reaches for the scraps, and guess what? She was scraps. And yes, Jesus acknowledged later that she had sinned. But he said, go, I'm not going to condemn you, which is another way of saying I forgive you. Go and stop sinning. Don't do the sin anymore. So Jesus didn't gloss over her sin, but he saved her life. We live in a world nowadays where our culture would rather Jesus have either killed her or said you didn't do anything wrong. But Jesus did say that she had done something wrong. He did acknowledge her sin. He told her the truth. That's because the love of God stings sometimes. But you know that scalpel stings to save your life. And that knife that's been heated up on the stove can stop that infection. And sometimes you have to lose a toe to save your body. And the truth of God and the love of God will sting sometimes. So Jesus did not gloss over her sin, but in saving her life, he was saying, I see more than you can see. And when he reached for you and me, way down to where I was, the song says he took a chance on us because he could see more than we could see. When Jesus sees the scraps, he sees something good that's going to come out of them someday. And he sees an anointing on your life, even if you're in methamphetamines or prostitution. He can see an anointing on your life. He can save you. He sees more than we see. Jesus saves the scraps. I'm going to tell you something else. Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners. People that for good reason were rejected from society. And publicans were people that in often case were Jewish people, but had betrayed their own people to raise exorbitant amounts of money and also add a percentage. Publicans were basically the modern day, the, the ancient equivalent of credit card processors. They're horrible. And, I, and I'm, I'm appalled that now they've added another percentage and now they're charging the, I was okay, you know, 2.5%, two, 3% 2 for using their banks. Now it's 4%. I feel bad for these business people. I feel bad for the big companies and the small companies. They're basically publicans and sinners. Can you imagine hanging around your neighborhood in Jerusalem and this guy that's the same Jewish blood as you are works for the Roman government stealing from you? And you know good and well that Caesar only asked for 10%, but Matthew, whose name was Levi, who Jesus saved and made a disciple and then an apostle, was a publican. And they were allowed by the Roman government and by the Herodian government to add on a fake percentage. And so here's Zacchaeus charging 15% and making his neighbors more impoverished. Okay? Jesus hung out with those kind of people. Jesus hangs out with people and loves people that you and I don't want nothing to do, to deal, do with. People that we don't have, want to have anything to do with. People that, that absolutely reek of sin and of the flesh. Jesus hangs out with them not to make what they do right. 
not to gloss over the sin, but because he sees more. And Jesus regularly spent time in the home of a publican. He had dinner with a little bitty short guy named Zacchaeus. He said, come on down out of that tree because I am coming to your house today. And this offended a lot of people. And then he went into the home of a Pharisee and let a woman who was a prostitute come and anoint him hanging out with those people. I'm not suggesting that you go into the bar and order a Shirley Temple today so that you can hang out with those people. That is not what the word is saying to us. But the word is saying that sometimes Jesus is able, or every time Jesus is able to not to get his hands dirty and not be repulsed by our sin. And therefore we ought to be humble, number one, and we ought to also be encouraged that Jesus loved us enough. And number three, we need to understand that Jesus is reaching for people that we may find undesirable. And he loves them. And he cares for them. Jesus was comfortable with his reputation being justified in the future and being castigated in the present. Because in Matthew 11, 18 through 19, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he hath the devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Let me tell you something. When you live for Jesus, you need to learn, uh, first of all, who you were and who you are, and, and, and next you need to understand and be comfortable with having your reputation smeared or besmirched in the present because you know Jesus made himself of no reputation. He had every right to make himself a reputation. How would it, been, how would it have been if Jesus had made himself a reputation according to you and me? Or according to the people of his day. He would have been on a white horse. He will be one day. He would have been wearing a royal robe. He will be one day. He would have come with trumpets instead of sheep and shepherds and there would have been angels all around him announcing him to the whole world instead of just shepherds. And he would certainly not have been in a manger in a stable stall. We need to understand that as we live for Jesus, sometimes our reputations are going to be placed before the trial of judgment of society. Jesus was comfortable with the fact that in the future he would be judged righteously. But in the present, sometimes people would make fun of him. We're not supposed to fit into this world. And part of understanding that we are royal children is understanding the world don't know nothing about royal children in Jesus Christ. The world looks at us as foolish. The world still thinks of us as scraps. The world makes fun of people that give themselves over to Jesus Christ while louding and causing to have heroic status people that parade themselves out around in sin and debauchery. The world is flipped around in its mind. Jesus, in reaching for the scraps, was okay that other people thought of him as foolish. He didn't have a problem with it. And neither did Paul, because he said, I'd rather be made and I need to be made a fool for Christ's sake. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter all the day long. I want you to know something. Jesus reaches for the scraps and he expects us to do the same. And he expects us not to think too highly of ourselves because the word commands us that no man should think more highly of himself than he ought. Jesus brings salvation. I'm closing this up quickly. Jesus brings salvation to those that we might consider unlikely candidates. The Bible says that after Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today because you're also a son of Abraham. Uh, I came to your house today because you're also a son of Abraham and I'm going to save you. Jesus said something that had very little to do with Zacchaeus in, in the sense of how he said it. He said, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I don't know about you, but I have very little patience and very little time to look for lost things. There are a few things that I'm still looking for that bother me. But most of the things that I've lost in the past, I've, Brother James, I've just had to let them go because I don't have the time. You know, if you're, if you're trying to fix a car and the screw falls down into the engine, you can spend all day long trying to find that screw, but it's going to be very hard to differentiate it from a bunch of metal and plastic. Just go get another one, right? Jesus cares about the penny. He cares about the sheep. And he cares about the son. That's why he told three parables, one of them about a lost penny that a woman swept the whole house to find. 
and a lost sheep that a shepherd turned the world upside down to find and a son that a father kept the candle burning for him for all those years till he came home. Jesus cares about the scraps and he brings salvation to unlikely candidates and you and I were unlikely candidates. The Bible says that everybody that will receive him can have him. The scripture says he came into his own which were the ones that were supposed to receive him. And everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry was to Jews first. That's why just a few times some Gentiles, while Jesus was still alive and before his crucifixion, it was a very rare occasion when Gentiles were able to get through to him. You have the, This is not a comprehensive list. You have the centurion, who was not a Jewish person. You have the Syrophoenician woman that Jesus actually called her a dog. And she put up with it and agreed with it. And then you have at least one of his disciples that was a Gentile. And likely one of his disciples was not Jewish, but was African. And so you didn't know that, did you? Very high likelihood one of his disciples was African. And so not a Jewish person, but a follower of Judaism, because you don't, even in the Old Testament, you could become a Jewish person if you joined the religion of Judaism. And so we have Uriah the Hittite, a righteous follower of Judaism, and we have Ruth the Moabitess that came in. And so you could come in as a proselyte. And so very little that Jesus did had anything to do with Gentiles until after when Paul was sent to preach to the Gentiles. And so he came into his own because Jesus is, is God manifest in flesh and he's just. And he wanted to give them the first dibs at salvation. But on the day of Pentecost, it was spread and over the next three years begin to be spread to the whole world. And so I'm not Jewish. I'm not one of his own by blood. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And so because I received him, even though I'm not Jewish, I just checked my DNA on Friday just to make sure. And the closest it could come was there could be some Spartac Jewish because I've got some... Uh, cross between West Asian and North African blood. So there could be a little in there, but there's no sign of Jewish markers. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because I've been made a Jew in the words of Paul in Romans, inwardly by Jesus Christ. Because I have received Him. You don't have to be what everybody else thinks you should be in righteousness to be able to receive Jesus Christ. All you have to do is receive Him in faith believing because He is willing to take the scraps. He is willing to cause you to be able to be adopted into His kingdom. He cares about you. He told those disciples, you are not done with your work today. There's laying all over side of this hillside with all of these people with full bellies because the Bible said they ate until they were filled. Okay? So that's golden corral filled. Okay? That's not like two eggs and a piece of bacon filled. <laughs> Brother Brandon filled us up good yesterday. Thank the Lord for that good breakfast. Jesus caused his disciples to go forth and make sure that everybody was filled with fish, which would have been smoked fish, and eggs, uh, not eggs, bread. I'm hungry for smoked fish and bread because I ate fish last week and, and eggs for breakfast and I'm still hungry. So I'm hungry today, so you have to forgive me. He made sure they were filled, but he said, your work is not done. Go all over that hillside and pick up all those nasty, disgusting scraps that nothing be lost. Jesus cares about lost people. He cares about the ones that are ugly and disgusting. And I want you to know every one of us here today under the sound of my voice, including myself, was ugly and disgusting. And I remember what Jesus did for me. I remember when he found me. I had not committed a whole lot of sins according to other people's idea, but I was going to a devil's hell just the same, just as bad as any double murderer that's sitting on death row. I was worthy of destruction, but Jesus saved me. Even though I was worthless and useless to him, he said, I see something in him. And he saw something in you. And he cares enough to keep reaching for you and loving you today. Stand with me right now.
When's the last time you were thankful for salvation? It is, it maybe it was yesterday, maybe it was today, but I happen to think, I happen to be of the opinion that it's a good idea for us to be reminded of how blessed we are in salvation from time to time. I think we ought to be grateful for salvation every single day and what Jesus had done for us and let there be stirred up within our very souls a desire to be the hands and feet of Jesus going forth and reaching for those that are scraps in the name of Jesus. And if somebody won't let you reach for them, just move on to the next person until somebody lets you reach for them. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You got a basket. Don't stop until you fill it. And don't consider your work done until you breathe your last breath. I know, I know it can be frustrating reaching for other people, but don't give up because Jesus loves those scraps and you were one of them. I want us to come. I want us to pray. I want us to connect with our salvation today. I want us to ask the Lord to give us a burden. And I want us to ask the Lord to give us a thankful heart.